No one would go out with a t-shirt and shorts. That was completely unheard of. Right? All men, even children, they would dress like the adults. You didn't have this children's section of the department store where you, know, you had a t-shirt with a clown on it. Now you go to the adult section, and that's what they sell for adults. Right? So you go out and you see the guy in, in his, uh, uh, what's that hat called? The baseball hat, and you know, has like a, a Mickey Mouse and something on his shirt and his shorts, and he's taking his you know, young son, he's wearing the exact same thing. And they could be Muslim, and then you see the woman walking behind them, and she's wearing like her long abaya and her shawl. It's like, what is that? You know, how, how's that? You know, why, why does that work for him? And it, you know, it's not. And I could see how when people see that, and they look at us, and they think that looks like that woman is oppressed, because the guy is getting to dress him in which way he wants, while she's forced to dress in that particular way. So I think to really fix, kind of, let's call it the hijab, and I don't like that word, but. Let's just call it that for now, so people call it the hijab issue. It is dependent as much as men improving their mode of dress to improve that issue more than the women themselves, right? When we start dressing properly, when we start dressing right, us males here, then I think it will be much easier for our females to do so. But if we think, you know, we can go walk around like it's always, you know, we're at Disneyland uh, and that's okay, you know, I, how do you think she feels when she sees that, right? You know, hot, scorching Australian heat, which we have, I haven't experienced yet, but I keep hearing about it. You know, and you know, they have to wear that, and we're out there, and you know, out in our shorts and our t-shirt, and you know, maybe we have like, a, you know, what's that, a wife beaters, what do they call them? Singlets. Huh? Singlets, yeah. So I think, you know, we have to look at it from that overall perspective. Let's not isolate, you know, it's not an idea of just women's dress, it's about our dress in general. And dress is indicative of, you know, it's kind of the, the covering the dignity of human being. So as much as women have to observe that, men do as well. But going back to the point I was trying to make, uh, that's still something we're navigating in terms of dress. And also navigating in terms of interaction. I've been in countries where um, I would stay days, I didn't see a single woman, ever. I didn't even, I wasn't sure they, did, they existed. What, is this like whole village all men? Or are there no women in this place or what? But I later realized that that's their cultural context. You know, in some of the kind of outlying regions of, um, you know, the Atlas Mountain area in Morocco and things like that, you just go a few hundred miles north to Casablanca, it's completely different. But if you're in the Atlas Mountain in the, or in the Reef region in the north where I was, you know, I was like, wow, this is like something that, I didn't imagine it would be like this. But that was their context. That's how they practiced their deed, right? Whether that's still good to do now or continue, that's a whole other debate, but that's where they're at. And if we try to take that particular model, let's say, let's apply it in Lakemba, it's not gonna work. It's completely not gonna work, right? Nor should we advocate or think about taking that model and making it work. We know what the general principles are, right? And that the Sharia seeks to preserve the dignity of man and woman. And by doing so, it also ensures the dignity of the community and society as a whole. So that's an overarching objective. We need to follow that. But how we actually manifest that, right, in terms of interactions, in terms of dress, those things will be subject to kind of um, local circumstances. So let's go back to the basic things, you know, covering and not being transparent. It doesn't have to be a black abeya. It doesn't have to be a manto. It doesn't have to be something very specific that comes out of a cultural context, right? Maybe we'll come up with a whole different Australian dress, right, or that's specific to here. And in fact, I think what you find more often than not is it incorporates some aspects of the indigenous culture. For example, I think the, the, the masajid that we build should reflect the local architecture. And in fact, our masajid with domes and minarets back where they are, they do reflect the cultural, uh, the local architecture. But if we build a mosque here that looks like something that came out of you know, Baghdad or, or uh, Islamabad or something like that. It looks out of place, right? That's not, that's not the architecture that they have here. It doesn't really blend. There's no stipulation where I have to put a dome and a minaret on it. It's not essential, right? How do we know it's not essential? Because we, we read about the deen. We know what's essential and what's not, right? So some people take their particular cultural context and they essentialize everything about it. And they do so because they don't know. It's jahl, it's ignorance. That's why we need to be at a level of awareness and a level of knowledge where we can recognize the difference between the two.